Welcome to Human Solutions, simplifying HR for people who love HR. From AIM HR Solutions on True Story FM, I'm Pete Wright, and this week we're talking about phone calls, y'all. You ever wonder, as we mention on the show that we have this hotline, you ever wonder what people actually talk about on the hotline? What's the big dish? Who's spilling the tea? I am really excited for this conversation because Terry Cook and Tom Jones, my podcast partners, are going to share the top calls that people are sending to us on the hotline. We're going to talk about PFMLA. We're going to talk about how to handle leave requests and navigating adverse actions. I mean, just all kinds of HR stuff. That's what's on deck today. Top calls to the hotline. Terry and Tom, I'm so excited. We get, it's just free range today. <laughs> yeah. This is <laughs> this is such a, a wonderful uh, topic. We, we talk about the hotline all the time. We talk about these issues all the time. Let's talk first about what is the hotline? Please, what what is the hotline? How do I get to call and complain to you guys? <laughs> Thanks, Pete. So yeah, so the hotline is something we make available to people um, that are actually members of AIM, but um, they can call us anytime, Monday through Friday, with any HR questions from 8.30 to 5, and we even recently added an email address. So when people have these burning questions that keep them up at night and they're off hours, they can send that email and know that we'll take care of it right away in the morning. So um, it's a great it's a great service for people. It's really a help to have somebody else that they can ask questions, bounce ideas off of. I don't know, Tom, if you'd like to add anything yeah. to that. I mean, it's interesting over time. I think one of the things we've learned a lot, Pete, is that when people call us, the HR professionals call us, they really pretty much know the answer. What they want is someone to bounce it off of. And talk it mm -hmm. through, because then there's no one at their company that has the same insights that one of us on the helpline is going to offer. So it's a different perspective for them. And you know, when we will bring maybe the experience of the law, experience of uh, HR careers, is bring that to the table as well. So we offer new insights, but a lot of times people are very aware of what's going on in their company and how to handle it. Just needing needing a friendly voice to rationalize: Am I crazy right now? Yes, is what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> well, that's uh, super useful. And I'm going to start calling just to talk to you guys about my daily woes. There you go. We right. look forward to that. Pete. That's right. <laughs> let's uh, let's dig in. Now, we've we have uh, I said we're going to talk about, you know, the top five calls. Well, really, we're talking about buckets of calls. Right. And we're going to start with navigating leaves of absence. What is going on with leaves of absence that is bothering our HR pros? who are calling you about it. Tom, you want to start? Oh, my gosh. It's easily, <laughs> leaves of absence is definitely the case. And Massachusetts has a relatively new law called the Paid Family and Medical Leave Law. But a lot of states have it, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, New Jersey, New England states. A lot of states are coming in with this law in, in various forms. And the complexity is because now it's a paid leave. People are very, very concerned about, who, you know, how do I find out if someone's um, – has so much time involved on the law. Who makes the decision about whether they're eligible? What can I do if the law says I can't retaliate against them? How long do I have to wait before I can discipline them for what they do? There's a million different subtopics that are built into this law. And every state's kind of feeling their way learning how to do it because you want to be very careful. You know, employees have a very good sense of their rights as they should under the law. There's poster put out there, there's policies, there's information being put around. And so folks want to make sure that HR folks, especially want to make sure they're managing it well on their side. Uh, Terry Moore, you want to add? No, I, I would agree with you, Tom, on the um, state aspect of it, because it is confusing. Um, and again, we're, we referenced the Massachusetts law, but as Tom mentioned, several states have paid uh, family laws. And if they don't, there are many more probably coming. Um, but I think it's also confusing because there are other leaves of absence that HR people are dealing with right now. They have dealt with years with a federal law under family medical leave. Um, they have, you know, other laws. There's um, other state laws like domestic violence or small necessities, but there's um, USERA for the military leave. So there's so many different types of leaves that I think the HR professionals or other business professionals that might call us are really trying to unravel all of these uh, letters of laws <laughs> that they are dealing with, trying to figure out how to handle them, how to deal with them. Um, 
you know, Tom referenced the the paid family leave in Massachusetts. It's uh, very different from the federal law that a lot of people are used to. It's a paid leave, number one. Um, it also is available to almost every employee, um, even if they're brand new with your company. Um, so it can introduce a lot of different aspects. It's um, a lot of companies, doesn't matter if you're a small company, still applies to them. Um, so that uh, has a, a lot of other potential bumps in the road that they're dealing with looked a little different than the bigger companies. So as Tom mentioned, there's just a lot to these laws and um, people that are calling us on the, on the um, hotline are just trying to figure out what they need to do and how to really understand it and navigate it um, properly. One of the other things, picking up on what Terry said, is that for years, the FMLA, the federal law, was that you, the employer, had to make the decision about eligibility under a lot of these new state laws, that's been taken away from people. It's now, okay. it's kind of like the unemployment insurance program in some states where you, the person goes to file for unemployment, the employer can only maybe offer information. They don't play a real decisive role any longer as the decision maker in these situations. So it's really forcing some of the, especially more experienced HR folks to realize they have a new way to look at this that is different than how they used to do it. Tom, you said something in, in the middle of, of that description that employees have a good sense of their rights. How often are you getting calls, you guys, where the where the we're trying to navigate the employees understanding of their rights and the rapidly sort of evolving landscape of the law around leaves? Well, I think most people know they have the rights and that the HR people know that, too. I think Trickier things, at least in the nuances of every state's law, are things like, what can I do about somebody when they come back to work? You know, the retaliation provision in Massachusetts is fairly broad, which says for the six months after you return to work, you can't really adversely affect some, discipline somebody for taking leave. So if I start disciplining an employee, am I doing it for taking leave? Am I doing it for their chronic absenteeism? Am I doing it for something else? And that's going to be a very tricky um, minefield that employers are trying to work their way through because we we keep looking for court cases that will help give us some guidance, like there have been over the FMLA for many years. And we don't see them yet in Massachusetts because a lot of companies, I think a lot of HR folks are being very cautious. I mean, I would also add, Tom, that um, I think the only difference is because smaller employers did not have to deal with the federal family medical leave that was for um, companies over 50 employees. Um, I think they are the ones that might have called more related to your question, Pete, where the smaller companies in Massachusetts might be calling and saying, well, I don't think they understand. I'm too small of a company to have to deal with this. And then right. we have to educate them and say, actually, you're not. Um, yeah. So I think when you're asking that original question, that's what came into my mind is that maybe the smaller companies that didn't have to deal with the FMLA, like Tom mentioned, the federal one, they're the ones that might have employees coming to them saying, oh, no, I, I've been told by my family member, or my neighbor that I have yeah. access to this and that you have to give it to me. So um, I think that would be what comes to my mind. Yeah. Uncle Joe's an attorney and he promises. <laughs> uh, what, explain to me um, it calls that you get around intermittent leave. Oh, that that's probably the worst part of the law for a lot of people. I mean. You know, from a, that's really easy to from a benefit from an employee's point of view. It's a wonderful benefit because you're going to be out one day a week or two days a week for medical treatment. But and if the documentation supports that, that was true in the FMLA, the federal law way back when too. You would get that time off. The tricky part for a lot of employers is that on the parental leave side, they have to decide: do they want to give family? Leave the men say typically it's the father bonding leave on an intermittent basis, maybe one or two days a week while they are, while their um, partner is home with the new child so that they can play a role in raising the child or not. But it, it find, employers find it extremely disruptive. And then to, to Terry's point about the small under 50 employers that are missing now a person from work that they relied upon, it's a real challenge. That it's, that it's you're missing a significant amount of time for one person, the impact on the team is significant, but it'd be even more significant to hire somebody and train them to fill in a day or two a week. Exactly. And hire to find someone. Yeah. 
It wouldn't right. be available under that schedule. So the law says you don't have to give it to somebody who's a, per, a parent, but a lot of companies are struggling with, you know, can we keep workers? Are we going to treat them better? And so what's the work? What, what can we do? It becomes a real challenge for a lot of employers. Are we going to hold on to retain good employees? Yeah. And is this the price we pay for having to hold on to them? And they only can, they only can decide on the intermittent leave whether they, the employer wants to provide it in the situation of bonding with a child. So if it's a medical reason, they don't have a choice. They have to allow the intermittent leave according to what the doctor's note is provided. As Tom said, the notes aren't given to the companies when it's the, the Massachusetts state paid family leave. It goes to either a private insurance company or the state. So you as a company are only given this information to say, this person, Pete, is going to take two days a week off for the next X number of weeks to care for their self or their family member. Yeah. They don't have a choice in that part. As an HR pro, you don't know if I'm going to be taking care of grandma, ma, spouse. You don't get to know that. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't see the notes. If, okay. And that, that was a hard adjustment, Pete, to be honest. We got a lot of calls at the beginning because, as Tom mentioned, in the federal uh, leave, the HR person knew everything. They had to help make that decision and file that paperwork in their files. Yeah. And so they were in the know. They felt like they had a control of the situation a little bit. So you would think that not having to make that decision might make them happier because they're not the ones in the, the, the hot seat to make a decision. But for a lot of the HR people, that was hard. That was an adjustment because now they don't really know all the information they'd like to know because they're not the decision maker. So, right, right. And nor do they have the authority to know it, mm, which is even the harder right. thing because HR, it's been taken away from them by this law. You have to let go of control and exactly. agency. Exactly. And a lot yeah. of HR mm -hmm. folks, that's a struggle sometimes. Yeah. Especially when it comes to comp compliance issues. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's, let's take the, so I guess maybe the uh, the yang to that yin. What happens when people are taking their leave and then they decide, oh, I don't think I'm going to come back. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it happens. happens. I got another kind of weird sigh from you. That's two in a row I got from you. Tom. It happens. It happens. You know, companies. Yeah. People for whatever reason, most people, will, if it's paid leave, are likely to stay, not say anything till the very end of that leave, and then they'll say, well, I'm then I'm not going to come back to work. I think yeah. the, under the FMLA, maybe they. They'd leave earlier than that than they used to. But That's just strategy, Tom. I know. That's just strategy. It is. Right? It is. It's, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, as HR folks learn more about these laws, so do employees. And learn about the nuances within the law and what they can do and not do and how much flexibility there may or may not be. So that's the reality of the law nowadays. But as we segue into layoffs, companies could weigh people off that are on the leave. As long mm -hmm. as, I mean, the key thing here is, What's the reason? Is there a right. bona fide, legitimate reason for laying somebody off at this point or no? If there isn't, companies are in trouble. Like if they say, well, gee, so-and-so has been on a lot of leaves. I want to get rid of them. That's a killer. For the because that's retaliation. That's retaliation. But if the company says, look, we lost a huge contract that, to do whatever, and that's what Pete does here at the company, so we're going to have to let him go. That makes more sense mm -hmm. right. defensively. Pete, you're getting right. picked on quite a bit. Already. It feels a little <laughs> bit like I feel like the podcast dummy. <laughs> I'm trying to hold my own. But it, it's the hard part of the walk. Did you just lay me off, Tom? Like right <laughs> on the show? Not yet. Not yet. We didn't lose a good contract. Give any. We didn't lose a good contract yet. <laughs> it's all strategy. <laughs> but again, people are learning on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. As they as they see the law, appreciate the benefits the law offers. Some of the opportunities the law office may create problems. And then, interesting enough, the other problem that's a real challenge for a lot of employers is if I think someone's committing fraud, what do I do with that information? Because now it's the state or a private insurance company that makes the decision about who's eligible. So how do I figure that? Do I give them the information? Do I, do they, will they treat it as seriously as I am treating it? Well, that's, I mean, you're, you're asking those as uh, hypothetical or rhetorical questions, Tom. I feel like I'd like an answer to those. <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> what do I do in that case? You, well, you complain to the state. You say, gee, I believe okay. so-and-so is um, not really injured or not really sick or not really caring yeah. for somebody, whatever it might be. And then you rely on the state to investigate and see whether it's true or not. Or rely on the private insurance company. We offer both in Massachusetts, either private insurance or state plan, as do uh, okay. some of the other states. 
and you see, will they have to investigate? And I don't know, Terry, if she can do much beyond that at this point. No, I mean, I think all you can do is make the call and, you know, and, and really ask people to look into it and, and trust that it's being looked into. And I think in our experience, when it comes to the state of Massachusetts, um, a lot of the employers that have it either concerns about fraud or they've had follow-up questions about um, different payments that are going out, they seem to be receiving answers. So um, I'm not 100% sure on the private insurance side, I would think it's the same, but we have received specific um, information from our, um, our member companies that the state has been pretty good about getting back to them. Okay. Uh, Tom already teased our, our next topic is layoffs. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, we we did an episode on layoffs not too long ago in our last season. And uh, I in the spirit of uh, a, a brief review, uh, to, what is the Warren Act and what kind of calls are you getting be- from people who clearly didn't listen to that episode? <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you want to refresh them on the sure. WARN Act? <laughs> the WARN One Act is a federal law that's called the Workforce or the Worker Worker Adjustment Retraining Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Law. Basically, it got signed by President Reagan in 1988, and it requires employers that have a hundred or more employees that if they are going to do either a major layoff or a plant closing. They must provide up to 60 days advance notice to their employee. If they do fail to do so for whatever reason, the employees can sue them individually or collectively for unpaid wages. That's really the penalty for failing to comply with the law. It happens in Massachusetts, but again, the threshold is fairly high. You've got to be laying off a 30 workforce or shutting down. And oftentimes, unemployment, you know, layoffs will be five here, 10 there, and it won't trigger the rights under the law, but it does occur. Transitioning to the kinds of calls we're getting, Terry, what are you hearing? Sure. I mean, as Tom mentioned, they're not all related to the WARN Act, but there are a lot of people that might be seeing a change in their business, as we've been reading about and hearing about, um, and they may have to do layoffs. And so sometimes we walk that walk through that with them, and how do they select the people for layoff? And how, what is the safest way that they can look at who's being laid off? And, you know, more recently, we've talked a lot about um, work sharing programs. So that's an alternative to layoffs. So with work sharing, and I believe, Tom, when we looked it up, there are probably over 30 states that currently have a work sharing program in place. But at least in Massachusetts, work sharing is as it's as the name implies. So if you had somebody that said, you know, my business is reducing, I lost one contract. I don't want to lose Pete. We're keeping you, Pete. Um, <laughs> this has been a real roller coaster. <laughs> it really is. So anyway, if we don't want to lose Pete and we say, you know what? We could keep Pete busy three days a week, just not five. So the work sharing program would allow a company to apply for what they call work sharing. So the, essentially, Pete, you would be able to be paid by our company the three days, and then you would be paid by unemployment for two days. And that way you would still be happy enough to stay. And I, as a company, would be able to retain a good employee instead Mm -hmm. of doing a layoff where we would completely lose you because you would want to find another job because you were without full pay. And and what's the long term uh, prognosis of that relationship? Presumably that we're 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 considering a work share to avoid a layoff mm-hmm. because we think we have reason to believe that things will turn around for the business? Yes, that's exactly right. And when you apply for a work share, um, certainly can speak directly to Massachusetts. They'll ask you questions like that. They'll say approximately, how long do you feel this would be occurring? And okay. you usually give them a period of time. And then if it doesn't change, of course, you update the Department of Unemployment. And if it turns into a full layoff, it does. But at least everybody gave it their best shot to keep the employee actively engaged at the company. Right, right. I just want a rocking chair and a blanket <laughs> in the in a corner by the window. Is that so much to ask? It's I mean, just not, Pete. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of companies um, have have used WorkShare very successfully around the country. It's been incredible because of the big help. Yeah. Odd, you know. Interestingly enough, it was also used at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because a lot of companies thought, okay, this can't go on forever. So we'll try work share because we want to hold on to Pete and we don't want to lose him. And then eventually they realized that it took a year or more. They never 
it took a long time to come back the way they were previously operating. So presumes my next question. What's the what's kind of the long end that the Department of Unemployment is willing to concede work share for well, an uh, organization? In Massachusetts, and I think in most of the other states, too, it's the duration of unemployment benefits, which is 26 it's weeks. Here, but it yeah. could vary by state. But usually it's okay. the duration of the benefits that you'll get. Okay. So, so you're not applying for like a five-year plan. No. 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 Right. No, Some no, people right. probably might like it, but yeah. you know, depending oh, yeah. if they wanted that rocking chair for a couple of days a week. That's I don't exactly. know. You'd you know? be right back there again. <laughs> you know, Sweet but, spot. So yeah. Right in the pocket. But a lot of companies don't know about the WorkShare right. program. Even people that are yeah. calling us on, you know, on the hotline, they're just not. They're not aware of it. So how, how often do you find when you're talking to somebody on the hotline that you're introducing these kinds of concepts that they might not have heard of? If we get if we're in the helpline, we get what, 50, 60 calls a week, I would guess a couple of them a rake on a regular basis. We're introducing parts of the law that they've never heard of. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm asking that question not to say that people are calling aren't informed. I'm calling to say like there are some obscure parts of the law that you very well might not be considering. Please yeah. call the hotline. And I think that's a higher number, right? Because yeah, if they, you know, they they think about disciplining, they think about terminating, they think about doing some type of adverse action or or something else. And and we often our team would often say, Well, have you considered this? You know, have yeah. you thought about this? Because these could be all issues you're you're going to be challenged with potentially legally. So uh, and speaking of things that HR pros think about all the time, it's drugs, Terry. You know it's drugs <laughs> and drug testing. Uh, yes. it, you're you're getting questions about drug testing, and I imagine they start with, "Hey, pot's legal. Can we still test for it, though?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, they. We do get a lot of those questions, and not only do they have those questions, but they have the questions of, "Well, now that it's legal and the labor market is difficult, mm -hmm. we're finding more people that might fail." for marijuana because of what you mentioned, Pete, if it's legal, they feel like it's okay. You know, right. what I have the conversation with many member companies is I say, you know, alcohol is legal too. Do you want people to come up, you know, come to work drunk? No, of course you don't, you know, and then mm -hmm. you also have to take into consideration the type of positions you have. So if you have a safety sensitive role, you know, you have to be very cautious about allowing somebody that could potentially be under the influence of anything operating large equipment where they may hurt or kill themselves or others. So, you know, again, that's probably the extreme, Pete, but there are conversations that people often have with us and trying to figure out, you know, what is the right thing for us to do? And, you know, and, and we often talk to people, especially when it comes up for medical reasons, medical marijuana, we often encourage people to have the conversation. It's, it's a requirement. So Tom, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about the interactive discussion that we talk about with people. Uh, and again, the whole field of keeping Massachusetts unusual, as opposed to many <laughs> of the other states. The Massachusetts had, has medical marijuana, obviously, we've had it since 2012. But there was a court case in 2017 in which the woman had medical marijuana card, so she was officially a user of medical marijuana. She applied for a job, and through the back and forth of the hiring process, she was let go because of using marijuana. She then sued, claiming that she was wrongfully terminated because the marijuana was not going to impair her ability to work. It was only going to help her life, it would make her medical condition go better. And the net result was the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court came back and said, six to nothing in a vote. We believe that if a person is on using medical marijuana, and they're not using it at work, so they're not coming into work stoned or anything like that. And it helps alleviate a disability, in which in her case was, I believe, Crohn's disease. The employer needs to engage in an interactive dialogue, kind of like, just like the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, Pete, we understand from this drug test you're using marijuana on the weekend. You've told us that. You're not using it at work. We're going to basically trust that. But we're going to go back and forth and figure out, maybe you can't do this job. Maybe we have to move you to a different job. Or maybe we have to move you to a different thing, you know, a different function you can perform. But this has raised an issue. So if any Massachusetts, I go to hire Terry and Terry Post produces a card, says I'm a medical marijuana certified user, our conversation changes. I can't just say, well, you can't come work here because you're, um, you're going to fail the marijuana test. I have to say, if you can't, you can't use marijuana at work, 
You can't be impaired at work. And the big problem is there's no test out there like there is for alcohol that can test quickly impairment. The alcohol tests, you can find out how much someone's blood alcohol level is mm-hmm. very quickly. You can't do that with marijuana the same way because it could stay in your body for weeks. Well, and, and I'm not sure this gets back to the other, the first question though, which is somebody fails them a test for marijuana, presuming they're tested in the first place in a state where marijuana is legal, to that very point, Tom, is that grounds for not hiring somebody outright? Could be. Could be still in some companies. Some companies have federal contractors because the yeah. Department of Labor, they have to test people for drug-free workplace uh, compliance. So it could be that they have to say, okay. you can't work here. You know Other companies may have safety-sensitive people, like Terry said, you know, working with yeah. sharp machinery and Electricity. Our fictitious, yeah, our fictitious manufacturing organization, uh, a manufacturer. Exactly. Uh, if there's somebody operating heavy machinery, maybe working in, I don't know, finance, somebody who works with a lot of cash, maybe would be a consideration. Do we still do that? The, Is that a thing? The rules are safety sensitive. Okay. And generally, that's been you know someone who drives vehicles, someone who um, you know works with sharp instruments, razors, knives, things like that. Somebody who works with a lot of cash, probably not, unless they're, I don't know, I, I, that, would, that would take a lot of work to figure out how that would be. I don't, I don't want this to color my past, but <laughs> I had friends in high school who were denied jobs working in cash because they failed the, the uh, drug test. Mm. Uh, I was not one of them, <laughs> but, I, I'm, but I, I just remember those were the days. Well, that was a different time. That's right. I mean, and I think yeah. you look back at, we used to put out this, uh, we, we do put out this annual reference guide. And back in the early 90s, it had eight pages. It now has 90 pages to it. <laughs> and so it's, it's become Times a Times they have changed. <laughs> it's, a, it's much more complicated, challenging job than it used to be. And so, For sure. you know, yeah. groups like ours, groups like other groups, these podcasts, all these things are vital to keep people up to speed. With what's yeah. going on in the world, because it's so cha- it can be so so challenging for well, it, uh, a lot yeah. of these HR folks in different issues. Well, uh, so regardless of hiring, are there any broad strokes that you're telling people on the hotline about how you know? I guess specifically, First Massachusetts is dealing with recreational marijuana, uh, and more broadly, you know, uh, employees who are working in other states. A lot of me- recreational marijuana is. Um, it's starting to take effect around the country. So more and more states are doing it. So I think you, exactly Terry's point, you treat it like alcohol. Yeah. You, you, and you it's tell an people, yeah, it's impairment. You tell people, look, the rules of this company are the following. Right. If we test you and you have drugs or, you know, drugs in your system, marijuana in your system, then the consequence is the following. And I think you want to make sure you tell people up front. What's going yeah, on, yeah, so that yeah. there's not no surprises down the road. But I think more and more we're seeing companies do the opposite, which is remove cannabis from the testing process because they're. Des- is that not something? That's not something you guys would recommend. You keep it in the process, or are you advocates for taking it out? I think when it's safety sensitive positions, because I have a manufacturing background, I yeah. would be nervous to take it off the panel. Um, because I would feel like I would have a concern that people weren't thinking I was doing my due diligence and making sure that it was a safe workplace. So I would say from a safety sensitive workplace situation, I would be hesitant to recommend taking it off of the panel. Tom, I know you're starting. No, no, no. I was going to say the opposite. I just, I don't know what all the members would do, but I I think it makes sense to know. So then I can sit down with this fictitious Pete again and say, look, Pete, the test has come back. You failed. Um, we're making it clear to you, however, you may not use cannabis at work. If you catch right. you impaired at work, that is it. Because we need somebody working right now. And so companies are in the struggle of trying to figure out where they, yeah, how far do they push it's it. still an employee's economy. Yeah. How right. far do you push it? Uh, but it's a challenge. It's a real challenge for a lot of companies because they want to they recognize people can get high, they drink, or they whatever. For sure. But that doesn't mean they can do it at work because you don't want to be in a position where, like Terry said earlier, people are going to cut off a finger or cut off a hand. or cut. 
right. you know, do something and hurt somebody else, not themselves. This is this is the thing, though, Tom and I, I and and Terry. I feel like this is what we're talking about here. When you, as soon as you say impairment, what we're talking about here is we already have regulation for dealing with alcohol. Employees know not to come to work drunk, and when they do come to work drunk, there are consequences. We already have processes to deal with that. I guess the biggest question is, how is that any different from this now legal, in most places, recreational drug? And it sounds like not very. Mm-hmm. Not very, but I can test somebody for uh, alcohol and I'm yeah. going to know the answer. You know, if I do it within a quick time frame. Yeah. Marijuana, yeah. I'm, I'm testing you now and you were th- high three weeks ago. It still shows up. You'll never know. Yeah, but I, and I'm totally fine. You know, fictitious Pete is totally fine. Right, exactly right. And you're doing a good job. Of, and that's a big fight because people say, look, yeah. Monday through Friday, I do fine. If I get yeah. high Friday night, what do you care? Employer. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm back at work Monday morning sober. So navigating leaves of absences, understanding layoffs, a quick review of the Warren Act, and seriously complex <laughs> uh, uh, navigating the the, the drug testing uh uh, ecosystem. That really makes up the bulk of the calls that you're getting right now. Did we miss anything that you really want to hit it out of the park as we wrap up today? I think we'll always get calls on discipline and terminations. I mean, I think those are just common. People want to discuss their scenarios because their scenarios may feel different to them, or it may be different than what they've dealt with in the past. So they want to mm-hmm. talk of that through. I think those are a lot of calls, workers' compensation, um, cases and, and some of the longer term worker, workers' compensation call uh, cases are often calls that we receive. Um, and you will hear, Pete, you're referring to things as the hotline we have in the past. And Tom said helpline. So just to clear it up for everybody, it was called the hotline. We transitioned it to the helpline. Oh, so right. if you do hear <laughs> both words, they're, they're both okay. They're both um, okay. They're both right. okay. But yeah, the calls come in, I, I'd say related to a lot of that. There's a lot of pay questions specifically in Massachusetts because we have laws such as pay equity law and the treble damages law, which means employers can get caught up in paying three times um, whatever the award should be for the um, what the uh, missed wages were for the employee. So, you know, I, I'd say most days are could be anything. Um, I would tell you that the leaves of absence is definitely something that dominates a lot of a lot of our calls, especially within the last year or so. Tom, would you yeah, agree? Absolutely. The only thing I can think of is return to work issues. Mm, that's you know, when is, when is our fictitious Pete ready to come back to work? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, mean I, you saw him well, in the corner. <laughs> how far, how far can we push it? You know, can we get a medical exam? <laughs> Do we have to get a doctor sign up? Yeah, Do we have to. Right. Um, can yeah. We just take him coming back to work. Can we, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes when he's on the he's on a leave under the law, it's very clear what the criteria are. But other people take a few days off, and the company's like, mm, I don't know, well, you know. Bring them back. What's the issue? And it's yeah. a challenge. Post workers' comp injury, post ADA disability claim, post FMLA. It's really tricky for a lot of companies. It is. Well, I, if we learned anything, it's that no calls are off limits. That's You've right. got a question, call. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you'll find the the number and email address in the show notes of this very episode. Uh, last question. Uh, and, you know, whether it stays in is up to the quality of your answers. Do you have, <laughs> for each of you, a best call ever? I would say a funny call I may have had was <laughs> probably related to, to people trying to determine if they can, can date their subordinates. Um, <sighs> we so. didn't talk anything about relationships. <laughs> Harry, how did you let that go? I don't know. But I think it's like one of those things where I guess you could think it's funny. It wasn't funny to people that are calling because, no. you know, Tom and I recently did a roundtable on relationships in the yeah. workplace. For, how long, for Valentine's Day. Valentine's for Day. Valentine's for Valentine's Day. So we, we brought up all these statistics, Pete, that would scare you. Um, but, I mean, in all honesty, people spend most of their time with people they work with. So those kind of calls should not actually be unusual because any of us in human resources know that relationships happen at work. But yeah. it's it's one of those things where it was, a, you know, sometimes there's back and forth call, you know, conversations around it and just really trying to get us to tell them how to do it. 
you know, how can they? Not the relationship, the other stuff. <laughs> not the relationship. Yeah. They don't yeah. want HR help um, dating. No, no, I hope not. <laughs> no, well, I've had similar ones. Draw the line. <laughs> I've had two in the last month. I've had two love triangles in the workplace. Oh dear! Uh, yes, the, two in the last yes, month. Yes. Oh, what's happening? I know, and again, it, it, it catches everything. <laughs> you know, Terry's talking about the boss and the sub, sub, subordinate, and that was absolutely true in both cases. But it's just the um, the HR person's kind of pulling their hair out, thinking, "What do I do?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing to have a little bit of a you know a, a flirtatious relationship with a coworker, dating, whatever. It's a whole other thing to get into this love, this love triangle because. All three people in the workplace, there's violence, there's anger, there's, you oh, know, dear. so-and-so is encroaching on my relationship with somebody else. It just really can get messy very quickly. Don't hesitate to call, <laughs> y'all. Don't hesitate <laughs> to call. Before violence in the love triangle, please <laughs> call and get help mm-hmm. at the hotline. Check the show notes for the link and the number. Thank you both so much. Terry and Tom, always a pleasure to podcast with you. Huh. Thank, Thank you, Pete. Pete. And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to the show. We appreciate your time and your attention. Again, you can find all the links and notes in the show at aimhrsolutions.com or anywhere you're subscribing to your podcasts. Uh, And uh, jump in. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Music. We're everywhere great podcasts are, sir. On behalf of Tom Jones and Terry Cook, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you next time right here on Human Solutions, simplifying HR for people who love HR.